Welcome to the Criminology Access Module. This is your first lecture, now that everything is actually working properly. And for this one, we're going to introduce the key concepts that you need to know about. Um, so it will be a, a short overview of the course and the type of assessments we'll be engaging in, followed by a definition of some of the central terms, primarily criminality and deviance. What do those terms mean? How do we understand them? And from there, we'll start exploring some of the major theories within psychology that have been imported into criminology to help understand and explain criminal behavior and why people commit crimes, why they do what they do. Um, criminology itself is a combination of ideas and theories from psychology, from sociology, from anthropology, and from a number of other fields that we'll explore a little of as we go along. Now, the modules are broken down into these stages. We begin today with key concepts, looking at the major ideas and approaches to research within criminology. And for this, you have a 500 word case study and an 800 word data analysis, both of which I'll explain in a couple of minutes. From there, we move on in a few weeks time to the theories of crime module which does pretty much what it says on the tin. We explore some of the major theories of why people commit crime in more depth. And for that, you have a 1500 word essay, after which we go into the criminal justice system, looking at the police, looking at the court system and looking at the prison system. So the three aspects of um, the criminal justice system and understanding how they operate, how they develop, what their various different functions are. For that, you have a 1500 word research project. And lastly, we move on to the offender profiling unit, which deals with how forensic psychologists and criminologists develop criminal profiles, both for serial killers, which tends to be the main focus of those TV dramas that deal with criminal profiling, but also for terrorists, for sex offenders, um, all the way down to drug dealers and sh serial shoplifters. All sorts of criminals can have profiles developed about them in order to help capture them. And for that, you will be developing your own criminal profile of a fictional character. Um, and that needs to be 1500 words long and there'll be an hour long exam. But there will be mock exams for you to get into the swing of doing the exams again, in case some of you have been out of education for a while. And it, people are sometimes a little nervous at exams. So this is a sort of a practice at it before you do the real thing. In terms of the two elements of coursework for key concepts, um, your first is looking at a fictional criminologist, Maxine, and considering the issues that affect her. Now, she has been granted permission to interview a prisoner called William Cater, also fictional, who is an inmate at a Category A prison. Now, in this country, we have Category A, Cat B, Cat C, and Cat D prisons. Category D prisons are open prisons. Uh, usually they are reserved for people who've either committed very minor crimes or people who have been in prison for a very long time for a very serious crime, but who are now approaching the very end of their prison sentence. And the open prison is there to help them transition gradually into civilian life in the community getting them ready for release. Category A prisons, where William is an inmate, are the most secure for the most dangerous prisoners. The ones who would be considered an absolute nightmare if they escaped and got out into the community. So William Cater is inside for having murdered his own parents and five other people over a period of several years. And Maxine wants to interview him so she can find out about his motives, about his childhood, his teenage years, his background, his various issues. Um, clearly he has psychological issues that drove him to commit these murders, but he might also have other psychological problems that she would like to know about. And her aim is to use this information so that the police and the prison service can better understand how to detect people with these sorts of problems and maybe scores can get on board with spotting early warning signs to prevent someone ever going down that path in the first place and prisons perhaps can be better suited, better equipped to rehabilitate individuals. Now what you will need to do is look at the research issues 
that Maxine needs to take account of. So can she trust what William says to her? Uh, what security measures should she take? How could she go about verifying the information William gives her? It's, you're not attempting to account for William himself, but to look at the research issues and ethical challenges facing Maxine and do that in 500 words. Obviously we'll go over what those sorts of issues are as the next few weeks roll along. Your statistical evaluation is of British crime statistics for a particular demographic and the crime stats need to be from within the last 10 years. Now the link you can see at the bottom of the right hand column on the screen will take you to the Home Office website where they keep crime statistics. So that's where you will find your key information. Which demographic you do is entirely up to you. You might be interested in looking at female criminals or male criminals. You might be interested in a particular ethnic group or a particular religious group. Uh, crime stats are broken down in a number of different ways. So pick one of the demographics and look at crime statistics involving that group of people. Now, not only will you in your 800 word report describe what those statistics are, you could, for example, put them in a table or on a graph, but try to account for why they might be the way they are. That's where you bring in criminological theory. So if it turns out that far more men um, commit violent crimes than women do, why might men be committing more violent crimes? If it transpires that women shoplift more often than men do, why might women be more inclined to shoplift than men do? As well as offering theories for why these things happen, I'd also like you to offer some evaluation of the techniques used to gather the information. So for example, one of the issues involved in looking at these sorts of statistics is that these are only ever for crimes that have been convicted. By their very nature, we don't know what, cri what crimes people get away with. So it could be that there are far more violent women in the world, they just get away with it. Or it could be that there are far more shoplifting men in the world, they just get away with it. There are also factors to consider in terms of biases of judges, biases of juries, biases of police. Are they more likely to charge certain people or more likely to convict other types of people? Whereas a different group of people, they might be more inclined to let off of a warning at the police level or maybe not convict, maybe take other factors into account and decide that that person is innocent. So there's all sorts of factors that can influence who appears on crime statistics in the first place. And the third element there is to suggest possible recommendations for government to reduce crime rates. So if there are a lot of women shoplifting, what could be done to reduce that? If there are a lot of men engaging in street violence, what could be done to reduce that? So you suggest an idea, a possibility could be your own idea, or it could be something you've seen being used in some other country. So you could suggest that in Spain they do this, in, in China they do that. This could be tried in Britain as well. And that will take up your 800 words quite quickly. So, moving from there on to defining terms. We've got these two main terms to get our heads around today of deviance and crime. Deviance takes into account an element of statistics, the, the concept of the norm. In sociology, which is where this idea comes from in the first place, the norm, a norm is simply a common pattern. It's not a statement of moral worth. It doesn't imply that normal is good or normal is healthy or normal is desirable necessarily, simply that this is what most people do. So if in a particular culture most people walked around naked, then nudity would be the norm. And if in a different part of the world most people walked around wearing face veils, that would be the norm there. Whether one is better than the other is, is not the issue. 
And it's simply saying this is what most people do in a given culture. So deviance is a move away from the norm. It's somebody doing something different from what most other people do. Somebody standing out, perhaps. Now, they may, of course, engage in their deviance privately, so very few other people know what they're getting up to, or they may do so very publicly, in which case they're likely to attract attention. Have to bear in mind, of course, that in any given culture there is change. What's normal in the 16th century isn't necessarily still the norm in the 17th century. Things do move. Sometimes one person starts to challenge the norm. Um, what they do is very shocking. And then a hundred years later, everyone's doing it. And that has now become the new norm. Obviously at the moment, we're often hearing this phrase, the new normal being banded around with respect to COVID, the idea that new standards might come into play. So it has been standard for people to shake hands for the last couple of hundred years. Will it be standard for people in Britain to shake hands during the next hundred years? Or will all of this elbow bumping or foot bumping or some other variation become the new norm? We won't know till we get there, obviously. But things are changeable. Now, the vast majority of norms and deviances from norms do not represent law and crime. So in this country, it's the norm for men to wear trousers. But there's no law that says men have to wear trousers. And there is no crime in a man wearing a kilt or a sarong or a, a skirt. If you walk down the high street with absolutely nothing on whatsoever, that potentially could be a crime, depending on who notices and where that takes place. But there's no law that says he has to wear trousers. However, in any given society, there are some norms which are considered so important that the breaking of them does indeed become criminal. And so all crime by its nature is deviant because all crime involves a move away from what the ruling authorities consider to be the norm, consider to be desirable. It's just that these particular forms of, of norm breaking, these particular forms of deviance, are considered a lot more serious than many other forms of deviance would be considered. One of the issues of particular interest to sociologists and by extension to criminologists is the consideration of who creates the law in any given country and any given period of history. Now, in some parts of the world, laws might be set by a king or a queen or an emperor. In other parts of the world, such as our own, that we have parliament, we have bodies of several hundred men and women who sit around and debate and discuss and come to some sort of a decision as to what the law should be. The question is asked, are they creating law for the benefit of the citizens of Britain, for everyone's benefit? Or are they creating laws for their own personal benefit and their own interests? Or is it maybe a combination of a bit of both? Or indeed, it might not necessarily be that they are making laws for their own interests. It may be that they are passing laws for the benefit and interest of a particular vested interest group. It's a big business, something like that. So once we get onto the criminal justice module, we'll look in more details at who creates the laws and how they create them and the various influences on the creation of law. But you, you doubtless have your own views and opinions at the moment, and that will be something we can discuss in class next week and ongoing via Microsoft Teams. The same people who pass the laws in almost every country on earth are the same people who decide what is an appropriate range of punishments. Should a particular form of crime be punished with a fine, a prison sentence, execution, flogging, the removal of body parts, something else again? What would be an appropriate level of punishment? So should shoplifting be punished by a short prison sentence or a long prison sentence? Should it be punished by 
a fine, by flogging that person, by chopping their hand off, by making them do community service, or something else entirely. What would be appropriate? And again, we can get your views on this next week. The issue of why some crimes are much more severely punished than others often leads to discussions within criminological and sociological circles that suggest the level of punishment reflects how worried and concerned the lawmakers are about the particular activity. So there are occasions when it can appear that property-related crime gets more severely punished than assaults and rapes and murders. Does this suggest perhaps that the ruling classes of society are more worried about what is done to property than they are worried about what is done to people? Or is that a misunderstanding, a misrepresentation? Something to discuss and to think about. A lot of law begins with the idea, historically, we're going back a long period into history now, with concepts around natural law. The ancient Greeks were particularly interested in natural law, and it's also discussed by Romans and Egyptians and various other ancient cultures. The concept of natural law is that if we were to go out to the woods or the jungle or, or sit up the top of a mountain and sit quietly, we could observe nature. We could observe animals and plants and so forth, and we would notice certain patterns certain ways of behaving amongst creatures considered to be instinctual rather than intellectual. The laws by which nature operate are perceived by people who believe passionately in natural law to be wholesome, good, desirable. Nature would not do something wrong. It only ever produces um, harmonious laws that promote the benefit of life. Therefore, if you observe the laws of nature, this would give you a good basis to create human law in society. And to some extent, you can certainly see practical examples of this, a fairly obvious one that is referred to by a number of natural law theorists, is the case of incest. Why is incest in practically every culture on earth now and in the past illegal? One of the main reasons argued is that from a natural law perspective, if you observe animals that engage in incest, perhaps a small community of animals, or indeed you, you observe a group of humans engaging in incest and they have children, then those children are frequently afflicted by various severe health problems. And if that incest continues over a couple of generations, so the inbred children of one generation continue to inbreed with a subsequent generation, then those um, severe health problems become worse and worse and worse with every generation that passes and often result in quite severe intellectual problems as well, uh, intellectual limitations as well as health problems. Alongside that, of course, we, we can argue that there's a whole raft of emotional and psychological traumas that come from incest particularly where it's, it's forced into a, a parent abusing and exploiting a child, there are occasions where, for example, brother-sister incest appears to be more willing rather than one forcing the other. But even so, most psychologists, most therapists would say there is still going to be severe emotional problems going on as a result of this and perhaps even fueling it, leading to, be, to that brother and sister wanting to have incestuous relationships in the first place. And therefore, the law of nature is that incest causes problems. And if that's the natural law, then human law should follow suit by, out, by banning, outlawing incest. And there are kind of slightly awkward areas with this. You can say, well, what if you've got a, an incestuous couple who don't breed? They don't have children, so you don't have that worry about them breeding and passing on of severe problems to um, to the, the offspring. Would that make it okay? The law would say in practically every country, no, 
whether or not they have children, even if it's not physically possible for them to have children. Let's say it's two male relatives or two female relatives, so that there cannot be a case of, of pregnancy resulting from that union. Even so, because of the emotional problems, the emotional harm and the psychological damage, it should nonetheless be illegal. There are other corollaries we could look at, but it gets a bit ickier as we go along discussing that subject. So it's an example of where you might look to nature to provide a basis for what should be illegal and what's okay. What should be legal and acceptable. Were we able to get the Microsoft Teams working properly, then we could discuss your personal views on um, what you would do if you were a politician, if you were an MP in government, what issues would you consider as to whether or not something should be outlawed, whether or not something should be legally acceptable? What would be your standards? Uh, the first question you've got on the screen there, are certain acts universally held to be good or bad? It's extremely difficult to find any act which every single culture on earth for the whole of human history has condemned as universally bad or praised as universally good. Cannibalism is mostly regarded as a very bad thing in most cultures, but there are exceptions. There are some cultures where eating members of a rival tribe that you've killed in battle is a, a standard thing to do. So whilst it's considered fairly horrendous over here, in some parts of the world it would be an okay thing to do. Having said that incest is illegal in most places, there are cultures where um, incestuous marriages amongst royalty have been fairly common. Um, it's not always clear if they actually had sex or not. Possibly they um, had affairs with other people and the marriage was simply a, a matter of show so that they could keep the wealth within the family. That's not completely obvious. Except, of course, if we look at the Habsburg royal, um, royal dynasty, they, they definitely show signs of inbreeding, so at least some of them definitely were having sex with their relatives, even if others were just uh, finding their passions fulfilled elsewhere. So it is very difficult to come up with some, something that's always a crime everywhere, or always seemed to be good everywhere, which has been used as a counter-argument to natural law that if all law were natural and instinctive, every culture on earth would come to pretty much the same conclusions. The fact that there is variation between cultures has led some people to suggest, well, maybe the idea of natural law is a bit overblown, a bit exaggerated. Now, in this country and just about every other country on the planet, crime is broken down into various categories. Um, understood in various different contexts. This section will be going into more detail in a few weeks time when we get on to the criminal justice unit. But for the moment, just as a basic introduction, we have crimes against people, or perhaps we should say more specifically crimes against humans, uh, murder, rape, various forms of physical assault in which someone's body is attacked. They are assaulted, bruised, cut, broken bones, murdered, etc. There is a definite physical harm caused. Then we have crimes against property, stealing stuff by and large in one shape, form or another, or destroying things, whether through vandalism or arson or some other method of destruction. Um, usually property is perceived as belonging to someone, that's what makes it property. So it may be the property of an individual person robbing someone's house and stealing their their TV set or whatever you're going to steal. Uh, or it may be the property of the state. So uh, uh, during a riot, someone goes and burns down a courthouse, for example. The courthouse does not belong to a person. It belongs to the government, to the state. But it still belongs, and because it is property, it therefore is a criminal act. Places and objects that are not owned by anyone do not normally come under this category of crimes against property. So if 
something were to be, um, well, let's say one of my neighbours, for example, sometimes leaves bits of furniture out in the street with a note attached saying, free, please take away. Now, quite often the, the, the note sellotaped onto it gets blown away in the wind and then people walking past all they see is a, a chair or a table in the street with no note on it. If they were to take that chair or table, is that a criminal act? No, it's not. Because the the object does not belong to anyone. It's been placed out, it's been discarded. And picking up something that's discarded, just like taking stuff out of a skip, if you're a skip rat, is not a criminal act because it doesn't belong to anyone, it's not property. Therefore, you can take it, burn it, smash it up, do what the hell you like with it. It's a, a, no offence exists because no property rules have been violated. Then we have crimes against others, or we could put this more clearly as perhaps crimes against the non-human. So people who beat their pets or starve them or kill somebody else's pet or farmers who neglect or abuse their livestock, but also um, businesses tipping chemical slurry into rivers or people fly tipping their rubbish all over the place. So attacks on the environment, attacks on animals are constituted as criminal acts. Now, at earlier points in history, and in a few weeks' time we'll give you examples of this, crimes against animals were primarily treated as property crime. That animal belonged to somebody, therefore if you went and, and shot your next door neighbour's dog, you were destroying their property. And the crime was one of property destruction. Gradually over the centuries that changed to a recognition that animals are thinking, feeling beings who have a, a capacity for pain and suffering, and that even if the animal belongs to yourself rather than belongs to somebody else, you cannot torment your own animal. Now, you could, if you wanted to go and set light to your own sofa, it's your property, there is no crime in setting light to your own sofa. But there is a crime in beating, brutalising your own pets or farm animals. So, the idea of an animal being property, historically was the case in this country, still is in some countries, of course, but we have moved away from the idea that the animal is only property, so that now the, the owner of the animal is just as liable to be charged for harm as the person who goes and harms an animal that belongs to somebody else entirely. Now, wild animals can also come under this remit, at least to an extent although there are curious exceptions where somebody who um, goes and harms a dog is liable to be charged. Let's say it's a homeless dog wandering the streets and somebody deliberately goes and, and attacks it and, and does horrible things to that dog. They can face criminal charges, but if they were to go and shoot a sewer rat, they would not face criminal charges. So it does depend on the species of the animal as to whether or not there is a criminal uh, charge to be had. And of course that doesn't include things like hunting animals, you know, for sport or for food or whatever. Um, so there are exceptions to this and we can explore some of those exceptions as we go along. Finally we have the category of crimes against ideals, which is a somewhat nebulous category in which it's not always wholly clear quite who or what has been harmed by a criminal act. Blasphemy used to be on the statute books until fairly recently in this country, so someone saying obscene or horrible things about Christ or about God, um, or potentially, well, the, the blasphemy laws in this country were centred on Christianity, but in other countries they include other religions, so in some parts of the world you could blaspheme against Islam, or you could blaspheme against Judaism, for example. Who is it that has been harmed in an act of blasphemy? So if somebody says some really vile, nasty thing about Jesus, is the court to suppose that Jesus is sitting up in heaven crying because he feels so hurt about the horrible things that have been said about him? That seems improbable. It's not something that the, the court needs to prove, 
that Jesus is upset by what this, this person has said about him. So the harm as such is not to Jesus or to God or to Allah or to um, whichever being is as such being insulted. So who is it to? An argument is that potentially the harm is to the community of believers, people who will be shocked and offended by what has been said. If they hear it or if they read what has been said, they will find it to be insulting and it will more upset them. And so maybe the crime is against humans rather than against divine figures. But of course, as with anything, what shocks one person will not shock another. So if somebody says something vile about Christ, one Christian is really upset by it, but the next door neighbour Christian thinks it's just stupid and isn't upset by it at all. So the harm here is a bit hit and miss. A charge often made with the crime of heresy, which is no longer on the statute books in this country, but exists in some parts of the world, is that um, heresy to believe in the wrong religion, to break with the main religion and, and believe in something that is outlawed or banned. The risk there is to the individual's own soul, that because they have believed in the wrong thing, or they have said very offensive, blasphemous things, when they die they will go to hell, or they will suffer in some way. So by punishing the individual, you might get them to repent, to um, change their point of view, and you may of course, even if they don't, you may of course shock other people who observe what has happened into rethinking their own beliefs. So somebody else who might have been considering blasphemy sees someone getting punished for it and they think to themselves, oh, I better not go and believe that. So maybe there is a community um, benefit to it. We could also include things here like incitement to violence and verbal hate crimes. So where someone screams racist abuse or um, says some very, very sexist thing to someone, obviously there's no cuts, there's no bruises, there's no broken, broken bones, but emotions are upset, people feel hurt, they feel frightened, they feel intimidated perhaps. Um, so it, it's a bit more of an abstract notion of what the, the harm is. Um, likewise, the incitement to violence, telling other people to go out and commit violence rather than committing it yourself. Um, you have not caused the harm, but you have tried to, to wind other people up to do it. Whether they did it or not, it's still... The, so even if the incitement failed and none of the people you tried to, to incite did anything, it's still a crime. Which is, a, a, again, it, it, so it's a crime of ideas and ideals rather than a crime of actual broken bones, actual cuts and bruises, or actual death. It's a, more of a theoretical thing. Now, in understanding different types of crime, we need to get to grips with a few legal concepts. Uh, the law in this country, and in many, many, many countries around the world, favours the use of Latin. Uh, it goes back to all those upper-class classical education, when most barristers and judges and so forth were from very, very wealthy, well-to-do families who had been educated in boarding schools where they teach Latin. It certainly used to, and almost all of them still do. Actus reus is the Latin for a bad act, a bad deed. So, by and large, and there are exceptions to this, but by and large, most crime involves harm to someone, a bad act, a harmful act. Someone somewhere has been hurt. Now the examples we've gone through are already are fairly obvious. Someone's been murdered, someone's been robbed, someone's been beaten up, a dog has been tortured or whatever it may be. An act of harm has been carried out and it's of a sufficient level that the law of the land constitutes it to be a crime. However, we do have subcategories under actus reus. So as well as actions, deliberately punching someone or stabbing them or robbing them, it can also include acts of omission, acts of failure. So where somebody ought to have done something, but they didn't do it. And that has resulted in someone suffering and being harmed. So the parent who ought to be feeding their child 
but leaves the child to starve over a, a long enough period of time that they're not just a little bit hungry, they are actually emaciated and getting iller and iller and iller, and maybe even potentially starving to death. That is an act of criminal negligence. So it's not what they have done, it's more what they haven't done that's the problem. The fact they didn't feed their child is the problem. Likewise, a doctor who should be giving a, an injection of some medication to a patient, but decides they can't be bothered, they'd sooner go and have a cigarette and, and not do it, and that patient gets very ill or maybe even dies, that is a criminal act. It's an act of neglect because that person has been a failure in their duty. They ought to have done something, but they haven't done it. And harm has resulted. Alongside actors reus, we have the concept of mens rea. Now, mens rea means in, is the Latin for guilty mind, for deliberate intent. In most cases, the law requires deliberation. There are exceptions to this, but in most cases, deliberation. So in other words, not only did the person do the act, but they meant to do the act. It was deliberate. So the example you've got on the, the screen there of someone who accidentally picks up the wrong phone off a table because it looks like their phone and they genuinely think it is their phone, so they take it away, they are not guilty of stealing. Now, obviously, the person who owns the phone, they've been deprived of their phone, but they've not been deprived of it deliberately, maliciously. There is no mens rea in this act. So as long as the person, once they realise it's the wrong phone, they make an effort to return it, they have not committed any kind of a criminal act. It's not stealing. Um, there are occasions where lack of intent can still be constituted as a criminal act. So if a person, let's say they um, climb to the top of a tall building with a gun and close their eyes and fire at random, and by sheer fluke they, they hit someone. Now they weren't intending to hit that specific person because their eyes were closed, they had no idea who was down there, so it's not an intent to murder or injure Joe Bloggs because they didn't know Joe Bloggs was there. But the law would say that they, sh they must have realised what they were doing was extremely dangerous. It could have hurt someone and the fact that they did it anyway knowing it was possible to hurt someone, even though it wasn't guaranteed, it was at least possible, therefore there is criminal intent. So there are exceptions to this. Um, Children below the age of 10 are not perceived in Britain as having capacity for a guilty mind. So an eight-year-old who goes shoplifting cannot be treated in the same way as a 15-year-old who goes shoplifting. The 15-year-old is perceived as having criminal intent, the eight-year-old is not. Other countries have different ages at which they draw the line between guilty mind and, and the uh, pres presumption of innocence, the lack of guilt, the lack of intent. Um, the same kind of a ruling can be applied where someone is deemed to be um, not fully compus mentis, not in their right state of mind, because either they have severe intellectual disabilities or they are severely mentally ill and they're in a particularly bad um, state. And they, they are therefore deemed to not really know what they're doing at the time they commit a crime. It doesn't mean that person necessarily will be left to roam the streets committing more dangerous acts. They might be potentially sectioned under the Mental Health Act until they're, they're well enough to go back out in the community, but they would not face a prison sentence for something they did whilst they were not in the right state of mind. One issue we can discuss in more depth when we meet up um, not just this um, coming week, but in future weeks we'll come back to it and touch on different aspects and different elements of it, is the idea of a victimless crime and whether there indeed is any such thing as a victimless crime. Now, the, the very notion of the, the bad act, the actus reus, assumes that someone is being harmed and implicit in that is the idea that they are being harmed unwillingly, that they do not wish to be harmed. Therefore, it's a violation of their freedoms, of their civil rights, 
of their free will. That's not always the case with every act that can be classified as criminal. Um, so to take the, uh, the obvious example of the guy in the photograph snorting up coke, no one's putting a gun to his head, he wants to snort cocaine, he bought the cocaine, he wants to use it, he uses it, no one's being forced into anything. But the law still says he cannot, as such, have the freedom to snort cocaine. So even if he wants to do it, it's still a crime. Buying the cocaine is a criminal act. Walking around with a bag of cocaine in his back pocket is a criminal act. Shoving it up his nose is a criminal act. So even though it's difficult to pinpoint quite who is the victim here, no one is being forced into anything, um, if his body suffers ill effects, maybe the cocaine is badly cut or something like that, and let's say he gets a really horrendous nosebleed or it damages his septum, that middle bit of his nose, um, there, there's harm there, but it's self-inflicted harm. Is that a crime? Well, in law, yes it is. He is committing a criminal act, even though there is not necessarily any great deal of harm to him involved in that situation. We could flag up the environmental harm caused by the manufacture of cocaine in various parts of Central and South America, chiefly, where the, the, the way they make it causes horrendous damage to the environment. And there's so much crime associated in those countries where it's manufactured and then smuggled out to other countries abroad, criminal gangs shooting each other in the streets, um, forcing children to act as drug mules and knocking the seven shades out of them if they don't do it properly. There's all sorts of really horrible issues associated with the creation, production and distribution of cocaine, if not necessarily with the effect on the person actually consuming it at the other end of the, the, the line. Um, in some countries, prostitution is illegal. Most countries, actually, prostitution is illegal. So the, the woman, or occasionally the man who is selling their, their services, does so willingly, or usually they do. Obviously, there are cases of people who are trafficked and violently forced into prostitution, but they are thankfully quite rare, those cases. The research shows that the vast majority of people who... Um, sell sex do so of their own choice rather than because somebody has beaten them up and forced them to do it. So if someone is willing to sell their body, it's their body, you could argue their body their choice, should they be able to sell it if they want to. In some countries the law would agree with you and say yes, your body, your choice. In other countries the argument is it may be your body but it is not your choice because there are other harms that you might be harmed by becoming infected with a sexually transmitted disease or pass that sexually transmitted disease on to the customer if you've already got one in the first place. Um, the, the harm might be caused to the local neighbourhood so somebody who is hanging around on street corners trying to pick up trade may well cause a nuisance to the neighbours and there are the property prices in the neighbourhood that might be seen as a form of harm. A lot of feminist criminologists, and we'll look at um, the idea of feminist criminology later in the course, argue that women are pressured, um, if not necessarily with an actual gun to the head, nonetheless they are pressured by poverty, by drug addiction, by various forms of desperation, on the assumption that no one would willingly have sex with random weirdos if they could possibly find any other way of making money. There is a, a counter form of feminism <coughs> that disagrees with that and takes a much more positive view of prostitution and says that it can be empowering and that as long as the woman or man, as the case may be, is in charge of their, their services, in other words, as long as they have the freedom to turn the customer down if they don't want to, then they should be free to do as they please. So, within feminism there is disagreement, let alone within legal systems, about the interpretation of these sorts of behaviours. <clears throat> Up until the 1960s in this country, it was illegal for two men to have sex. 
Uh, it's, it's a different situation for two women, but it was illegal for two men to have sex, even though they were both perfectly willing and, and presumably enjoying the experience. Again, the argument was made that this was an offence to religious sensibilities. And we'll look at the religious element in law as we go along in the next few weeks. The argument was made that even if they enjoyed the experience in the short term, there would be long-term physical harms, long-term emotional harms, and that people needed to be sort of saved from themselves, in a sense. Needed to be prevented from harming themselves in ways that they didn't really understand, but which the government did. Uh, other people argued that the harm would be to wider society. Uh, even though the sex was taking place well, most of the time in private, uh, no one would necessarily see it or know what was going on. But if those two men walked down the street holding hands or you know, had, a, had a snog at the bus stop or something, then that would cause harm to wider society by causing shock and so on. Um, eventually, the law in this country changed its mind. In many parts of the world, it's still other law codes in other parts of the world still criminalise homosexuality. Um, is there a victim? Is there not? Should crimes only be a victim? Uh, sorry, crimes only be a crime if there is an obvious victim who is being forced against their will and having horrible things done to them that they don't want. It's open to debate. The aspect of criminology which is heavily influenced by sociology is also quite interested in the the role of the victim and the idea that different types of victims are understood in different ways by lawmakers and by wider society. So a common discussion within feminist criminology is the way in which sex crimes against women are treated compared to other types of crime and also in different countries. So in some countries there is a much stronger punishment for sex crimes against women than there are in other countries. So does this mean that one country values women much more highly than the other country does? So the, the severity of the punishment, the length of the prison sentence or whatever type of punishment it may be, does that say something about not just the crime, but possibly about the type of person who is most likely to fall victim to that type of crime? given that some types of crime tend to be carried out mainly against a sort, certain sort of a person. Um, give you a rather unpleasant example to mull over. Let's say there are two sex offenders and one sex offender goes out and molests a 35 year old victim and the other sex offender goes out and molests a 10 year old victim. Now the, the crime, the sex offence, the molestation is essentially the same thing in both cases. Is the assault on the 10 year old worse than the assault on the 35 year old and should it get a stiffer prison sentence or other type of punishment? So is, is it worse to do horrible things to the child than to do horrible things to the adult? Or should the law say a sexual assault is a sexual assault no matter the age of the victim, and therefore should be treated in exactly the same way. Be interesting to hear your opinions on this. Now, if we were able to do this via Microsoft Teams the other day, then I'd have asked you to form into subgroups and discuss your views on different types of crime, whether there are certain crimes you think should be repealed because they're pointless and silly laws, or whether you think there are certain activities going on at the moment which ought to be outlawed but haven't been outlawed yet. But maybe you can have a mull over this and discuss it amongst yourselves or chuck out a few ideas next week as we go along. But we'll skip on from this for the moment. This is Sigmund Freud, who is widely regarded as the founding father of modern psychology. Now people have been thinking about human nature and why do people think this and why do people feel that and how does the mind work and asking all of those sorts of questions probably since the days when we were living in caves and dragging our knuckles on the ground for some of us that was probably last thursday um, however 
in the Victorian era, Freud moved the discussion from general philosophy into a more medical and semi-scientific arena. I say semi because there, there are quite a number of criticisms made of Freud that his methods were not scientific enough. And therefore, his theories are a little bit questionable. But we'll leave that to one side for the moment. Um, Freud's argument, in a nutshell, and we will be coming back to Freud and all of these other people as we go along in much more depth, but this is just a taster. Freud's argument is that we have a large part of our mind which is unconscious. The conscious bit, the waking bit, the bit of me that's talking to you now and the bit of you, hopefully, that's listening to me now, is the conscious part of our mind, the waking part of our mind. That, he says, is just like the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of us is unconscious, the sleeping self. And the conscious mind doesn't really understand what goes on in the unconscious mind. Therefore, we are full of motivations and urges and um, impulses, which half the time we ourselves are not aware of. Now, when we're born, we're born with what Freud referred to as an id. The id is this kind of dark, impulsive, instinctual, baby-like self. Not in the, in the kind of cute, cuddly way that a lot of people view babies, but in a very uncontrolled way. So obviously, babies have no self-control to speak of. When they need to go to the loo, they do. When they're hungry, they scream and bawl to their fed. When they're tired, they fall asleep. It's all very, you know, want it, do it. It's instant, it's impulsive. They're, they're not um, lying in their cots thinking, oh, I better not cry now because I might wake my mum up. They have no concept of other people's needs or other people's wishes. They have no sense of self-restraint or any of that. So the id is that lack of self-restraint full of urges, hunger and tiredness and anger and um, the, the, the wish for cuddles and all, all of that kind of primal instinctual stuff, but without any self-control at all. Not only are we born with it, Freud said, we retain that part of ourselves for the entirety of our lives. So even if you live to be 99, it still doesn't go away. What we learn through our parents is self-control. So the parents, by raising us and saying, oh, don't do that, dear, that's not very nice. Or, oh, right, it's dinner time, you've got to sit down and eat, even if you don't feel hungry, you've got to do it. They teach us a degree of self-control where we learn, gradually, gradually, to rein ourselves in. And so things like toilet training for toddlers, it's learning that even if you need to go to the loo, you have to wait until you can find a loo, a toilet to go to. You can't just you know, pee in your own pants. You, you've got to, to wait till you can get to the toilet and then do it. So it's learning to control your bladder, learning to control your sphincter, just a bit graphic, um, learning to control your impulses and understand that even if you're hungry now, it might not be possible to eat for another half hour or an hour or a couple of hours, whatever. So that because there's no food available and you'll just have to wait till the food is there. There's no good screaming, bawling and shouting about the fact that you're hungry and, and there's no food available. So gradually we learn self-control. And for Freud, that self-control is referred to as the superego. That sense of a voice in your head that learns what to do and what not to do. That there are some things you have to do even if you don't want to, like paying taxes. And there are some things that you can't do, even if you really, really, really want to do them. Like punching a very not annoying person in the face. You can't do that. Well, well, you can, but there's going to be severe consequences. It's the voice in your own head. So when you're very young, it's the voice of your parents. And when they're not around, you revert to being like the id. But gradually, as you get older, you reach the point where even when your parents aren't physically in the room you know what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable and unacceptable. And that stays with you. Or it does if you have good parents. And this is where Freud started to look at crime and said that people who have very weak, wishy-washy parents, 
who are no good at teaching discipline or people who just the parents aren't around they could could have died or they could have run off or they could just be working every hour going and they're, they're hardly ever around to see the child those children don't tend to learn self-control to the same extent as other children do so they may pick up bits of it but it'll take a lot longer and when they finally do pick up bits of it it won't be as strong it won't be as internalized and so when they're 20 years old and they get the urge to punch some really annoying person there won't be a voice in their head saying don't do it therefore they will act on the impulse as far as freud is concerned the only real difference between a criminal and a law-abiding citizen is the the voice in the head that says don't do that so both the criminal and the law-abiding citizen have the same impulses so they, they, they both go into a shop and see the really expensive jewelry and they both think oh i'd like to nick that i wish i could have that i can't afford it i wish i could have it they both have that urge but one of them has the voice in the head that says stealing is wrong don't do it and so they don't do it that's the key difference now stuck in the middle between the id and the superego is your sense of self your ego which is trying to negotiate the demands of the id to do everything the instant it wants to do that and the demands of the superego that's very aware of society and law and order and what will mother say and what will father think and so on and it develops various forms of defense mechanism coping mechanisms to deal with the problems that ensue and the stresses that ensue. Freud came up with 30 odd of them and we will touch on some of them as we go along in the course. I'll briefly mention two of them in a minute. Uh, but the, the key issue there of arrested development is that the, the criminal is the person who has not been socialized well enough to control their own impulses. So their maturity, their development is limited. That's why they act on their urges when everyone else restrains their urges so he was of the opinion freud a little bit of a, a negative view of human nature that we are born with the it that we are basically these rather selfish self-indulgent impulsive creatures who need to learn to rein it in a bit and it's only the forces of parents and wider society that help to rein it in Without that, we would be like wild animals. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Obviously, if we were doing this in teams, we could discuss that here and now. But something for you to think about and bring to class next week. Do you think people are basically dark and destructive and selfish? Or do you have a more positive, upbeat view of human nature? Two examples of defence mechanism, those coping strategies, are projection and displacement and they can be easily related to crime. Projection is when someone has an urge in their cells, in their id, this, this dark destructive urge, which they are so um, frightened by, perhaps because they've been taught to be ashamed of it, they've been taught to be embarrassed by it, that they can't admit to anyone else, it's like they don't want anyone else to know they have these urges. More than that, they don't want even to admit to themselves that they have these urges and so they repress it and they bottle it up. What happens, Freud says, is that people start seeing in others, they project onto other people, the impulses they have in themselves that they can't admit to. And they react very, very badly when they see it. So if they see someone doing the very thing that they secretly would like to do themselves, they fly off the handle and they get really angry because it's too close to the bone. And they're quite likely to lash out at that person, physically or verbally. They, they will want to hurt the person who is able to do the thing which they secretly would like to do themselves. Um, one of the fairly obvious examples given in a lot of textbooks on this is the, the case of someone who maybe has... Um, gay urges in themselves they, they they either are gay or they're bisexual or at least they're thinking about it at the very least but can't admit to it in themselves they don't want to acknowledge they have these feelings 
And so every time they see someone who is gay, or at least they think they're gay, they, they sort of, maybe they're mistaken, but they think that person is gay, they will fly off the handle and rant and rave and maybe get violent towards them, or at least scream and shout at them and get abusive. And so you, you get some about gay bashing and things like that in the streets. And the argument is that, that the people doing it maybe are unable to come to terms with their own inner desires. Not everyone agrees with that, but that's an argument made by Freudians. Uh, displacement is another one. Displacement is where you have a strong emotion that you feel unable to express towards the person who provokes the strong emotion, who is the centre of the strong emotion. So you spill the emotion over into a different area of life. Now the emotion could be practically any emotion really, but because we're talking about crime, if we take the example of anger, so let's say someone is very, very, very angry with their boss uh, and would really like to thump their boss, but they can't because they know they'll lose their job and so on. So they bottle their rage up and they, they go away, they go home. That rage might release itself somewhere else. It could release itself by them shouting at the dog or uh, having a pointless argument with their other half and, and getting abusive to them. Or they might, on the way home, lob a brick through a window and vandalise something. They might destroy something because they want to really hurt their boss, but they can't. So they take their anger out on something that's a nice, safe target that they don't have to worry about so much. And so you could see violent crime either against the person or against property as being partly a, a lashing out, uh, an, an attempt at coping with anger but not a very useful attempt, because Freud would say, until you address the real cause of your anger, it's not going to resolve. It will just feel better for a little while, and then it will start up all over again. Uh, Freud did say there were constructive ways of trying to deal with things like this. So uh, sports like boxing and, and wrestling and so on are good ways of taking out anger without causing social harm and problems. Again, it still doesn't necessarily deal with the real cause of the anger, but it's a, a more constructive way of releasing it than smashing up a bus stop or thumping a random stranger in the pub. Chap in the photograph here is Burhaus Skinner, who was a leading light in the behaviourist movement. Didn't found it, didn't start it, but he was a leading light in it, he was at the behaviourist movement makes the argument that all behaviour is learnt. Learnt through a process of reward and punishment. So you start with young children, but the, the same process can apply to adults and, um, in all sorts of situations. So a little bit like training a dog to do tricks, you reward them when they get it well, when they do it right. But of course, being humans, we also tend to dispense punishments when, when the person we're training gets it wrong. So uh, you reward good behaviour, you punish bad behaviour. And eventually it becomes second nature to the person who has been trained up. Uh, they become good at what they're doing. Um, you may well have your own views on which is more effective, reward or punishment. Skinner was of the opinion that reward works a lot more effectively than punishment does. But other people have different views and different experiences on that one. So as far as Skinner is concerned, any behaviour can be trained. You could train someone to be um, a vicar, you could train them to be a doctor, you could train them to be a plumber, you could train them to be a, an IT consultant, you could train them to be practically anything. Equally, you could train someone to be a serial killer, to be a burglar, to be a um, sex offender. Which might sound like a really weird thing to say, you can't go on a course to learn how to be a serial killer. What does he mean by this? Well, he would say that look to that person's childhood. Look to the kind of dysfunctional, destructive families they may have been in, or the neighbourhood. Maybe they were born into a really rough neighbourhood. Um, there's lots of criminals in their neighbourhood, so it might not be just their family, it might be other people around them as well. And what kinds of behaviour are encouraged and promoted in that person's early years, what kind of attitudes are encouraged and promoted? Um, 
So then, let's say they grew up to be a burglar. Well, maybe they've been encouraged to be a burglar. Maybe they've been introduced to other older people who rob houses already and they get recruited to a criminal gang. Edwin Sutherland argued a very similar thing. His differential association theory is the notion that it's not just the family, it's the whole neighbourhood. And he, he studied very rough neighbourhoods in America and said, well, very young kids learn crime. They learn how to steal and shoplift and, and mug and all sorts of other things by getting actively recruited by other older kids and adults in the neighbourhood to join gangs. They get trained how to do things and when they commit the crime efficiently, they get rewarded. And if they screw the crime up and make a mess of it, they get punished, maybe by the police who catch them, or maybe by other members of the gang who give them a good thumping for being a rubbish criminal. And so they learn to engage in criminal behaviour. Now Skinner was entirely interested in behaviour. He had no interest in people's thoughts and emotions. That, that just didn't didn't appeal to him. He said it was very unscientific because you, you can never really trust what people say. Therefore, why bother wasting your time? Just look at behaviour. Sutherland was interested in, in people's thoughts and emotions and what goes through their minds. And so he said when these rough neighbourhoods are training youngsters up to, to be new recruits in the gangs, they don't just teach them skills, they also teach them attitude. They teach them to think in a certain way. And part of that thinking is the justification for crime. So knowing how to steal a wallet is one thing. How to be a pickpocket. But in order to get that person doing it, you've got to couple them with a, a, a thought process, an ideology, a way of looking at the world that says it is okay to steal money from that random stranger over there. They deserve it. Tough luck if they lose their wallet. Once you've got both the set of physical skills, the ability to pickpocket, and the mental attitude that goes with it, then you will have a functioning criminal. Uh, and so there are, there are subtle differences between different behaviourists as how they understand these concepts and these ideas. Um, so you could look at pretty much any antisocial behaviour and say, how is this encouraged and reinforced? Was it encouraged by the parents, by older brothers and sisters, by other kids in the neighbourhood, by a local gang? Um, you do get feminist behaviourists who will say it's, it's not only people you meet on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also wider society that can encourage or discourage certain things. So, for example, if the popular image of women in media and advertising and things like that is very sexualised, every advert you look at there's a half-naked woman draped over a car or whatever the thing is, the product that they're selling, um, you will start to think of women as always being sexual objects. And so feminist behaviourists say that, that that advert isn't directly forcing individuals to become sex offenders and, and rapists and what have you, but it is conditioning how they think about women. And so if they always think about women as being sexually available, just kind of you know, lying there draped over the bonnet of a car, then that contributes towards their eventual criminal behaviour. There are problems with that because obviously millions and millions and millions of people are seeing the same images. The vast majority of them don't become rapists. So there has to be more to it than simply seeing the images. But nonetheless, there is this idea that wider culture, as well as your immediate family and your next door neighbours, help to set a cultural agenda as to what is an appropriate way to think of different groups of people. So what's the appropriate way to think of women? What's the appropriate way to think of men? How about this ethnic group, that ethnic group? How about straight people, gay people, this rich people, poor people, this, that and the other? So we, we are encouraged to think about different types of people in certain ways. As far as Skinner and Sutherland and various other behaviourists are concerned, 
the way to deal with crime is to improve the reward and punishment system. So you punish the crime more heavily, more effectively, and you reward good behaviour more effectively. So encouraging kids through school, through youth clubs, through all sorts of other things, and adults as well, encouraging them to behave in good ways and making sure their, their good behaviour is reinforced is the other side of the coin to punishing bad behaviour. So if you've got a lot of criminals, it's because the punishment is very weak when they do wrong and the reward is very weak when they do well. It, and again, it's a, it's a little bit like training dogs to do tricks. Getting them to do what you want and discouraging them from peeing on the carpet. How can society train people to be good citizens? And so you can look at things like token economies, which we'll get on to in a couple of weeks, which is a way of rewarding good behaviour and punishing bad behaviour in an institution. Um, you might have a think about Sutherland's ideas around criminal neighbourhoods. If you were, let's say, a local councillor in whichever town or, or village or wherever you live, and you wanted to um, address a really, let's say you've got a really rough estate where you live, and there's a lot of crime and, and antisocial behaviour on that estate, what methods could you take to try and change that? Because Sutherland is, is very interested in this whole idea that behaviour of individuals can be altered at the social level, at the sort of management level of society, where you can institute policies that will help to change behaviours of individuals. Something to have a think about, and we can come back to that discussion later on in the course. Then we have cognitive theory. Now, whereas behaviourists are very interested in behaviour, obviously, cognitivists are very interested in the thought patterns, which, if you're unfamiliar with the word cognition, that's what it means, thinking, um, thought patterns, ideas. Um, two particular cognitive psychologists, Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis, who worked independently for quite a while, and then they met up and they, they found they had a, an awful lot in common and shared a lot of their ideas. They were mainly interested in helping people with therapy who had emotional problems and so on. They weren't quite so much interested in crime, but their ideas can still be applied to crime. Now, they said when they had um, patients in therapy, they could have two people who had both experienced a very similar situation, but who reacted to it in very, very different ways. So let's say both of them, two people who had both lost a husband or both lost a wife, um, one of them might be devastated by it and one of them might be coping fairly well. So it, they said it's not the actual event itself that is the issue. It's more to do with how you react. And how you react is largely influenced by what you believe about the world, what you think your ideas and perceptions of the world. So let's take an example, fairly low-key example. Let's say someone is, is ditched by their girlfriend. She goes off with somebody else and they're ditched. Now, the thought processes of that individual will, will determine how they react to being ditched. One person might be absolutely devastated they might feel this is the, the end of their life, they'll never find love again, they'll be lonely forevermore, and they can't possibly cope without her. The other person might think, well, that's sad, but there's plenty more women out there, I'll just find another girlfriend, I'll get over it in time, and my life will get back on track. And so even if they are upset and have a you know, bit of a weep and a wail and whatnot, they will nonetheless cope and get their life back on track. So the same event, essentially, but very different reactions, and those reactions based upon belief systems. How we think about the world. Where do those belief systems come from? Well, both Beck and Ellis say they are built up over a long period of time by influential people around us, usually parents, but other influential people as well. So we pick up on the ideas that we are exposed to, which is also something that Sutherland agreed with. We are heavily influenced by the ideas that we are exposed to. 
clearly we don't believe every single thing we hear, so there is a selective process to this role modeling of ideas, but we will go into that in more detail in a future week. So an event happens, your belief system kicks in, that will lead to an emotional reaction, happiness, sadness, anger, um, calmness, or whatever it may be in, in that particular situation. And that itself will then fuel another action. What do you do next? Which, as we're talking about crime, could well be a criminal event. So I'll give you a couple of slightly silly examples. Bob sees a sports car, keys left in. Any one of us could be walking down the street and see a car with the keys left in the ignition. What do we do? Well, the event could result in a number of possible reactions. So if Bob thinks in a very law-abiding way, then Bob might um, just walk on past, do nothing whatsoever, or he might try and find the person who owns the car and say, Oi, you've left your keys in the car. Or he might even phone up the police and say there's a car here with the keys left in it. However, if he thinks in a more criminal way, he thinks, what a plonker leaving their keys in the car, I would really want to, always wanted to own a Lamborghini, jumps in the car and drives off with it. He, his emotional reaction will probably be excitement. He'll enjoy it. He'll, it'll be a fun thing to do. And this is a key issue in crime. A lot of crime is entertaining to do in the short term. There's a rush and a thrill to doing it. And that, that rush can be quite um, addictive in a way. It, it can keep people wanting to do more crime because they enjoyed committing the last crime so much. If he gets caught and ends up in prison, it won't be so enjoyable then, but that's a long-term issue. And maybe Bob is very much a short-term thinker. And that can indeed be argued as a key feature of a lot of criminals, is that they, they often tend to think in the short term. Wouldn't it be great to have a Lamborghini? They're not thinking in the long term, well, once the owner reports it to the police, they'll be looking out for the... Um, for the car and you know, how do I explain to my friends and family that I've mysteriously acquired a sports car way beyond my, my um, income. Uh, what's going to happen when I get caught? They're not necessarily thinking in those long-term ways. Uh, likewise, Janice here, when she sees the riot taking place and thinks to herself, oh, that, that shop I really like is being robbed, does she think in a law-abiding way, pick up the phone and report it to the police? Or does she maybe just tut and roll her eyes and think to herself, aren't people terrible, and go back to watching the TV? Or does she think in a somewhat criminal fashion of way A, I'm going to rush down into the street, nip across to that shop, jump through the hole in the window, and grab myself a, a handful of whatever clothes or shoes or whatever it is that I fancy getting for free? And again, if she does that, she'll probably have a, a really thrilling time running down into the street. And when she gets back to her house and starts trying on all the clothes, she'll have an even better time. But is she thinking to the long term? Will she get caught? Possibly she won't. She might get away with it. But she might get caught. If she gets away with it, how will that impact her subsequent thinking? In other words, if you get away with one crime, are you much more likely to commit a second, a third, a fourth crime? because you've already gotten away with it once, and so your cognitive processes alter to think, well, actually, I'm quite good at doing this. I can get away with this. And so does it turn from an impulsive one-off crime into maybe a potential whiff of crime? Chap in the photo here is Ulrich Nisa who, another cognitive psychologist, he had a lot to say about how we structure memory. Again, he wasn't talking specifically about crime, but that can help. Um, and this is a name you might want to bear in mind when you're writing up your case report about Maxine, the imaginary criminologist. Uh, when Ulrich Nesser was talking about memory, a lot of people at that time thought that memory was a little bit like a, a sort of a, a film or a videotape. You see something, your mind records it, and then when you're mem remembering it later, it plays it back. And obviously every single time you re put a DVD in and replay it, 
it's exactly the same thing every single time. The DVD doesn't change mysteriously. Nessa said, actually, memory is not like a film. Memory is much sketchier, and it does change. So you're trying to remember an event. Let's say you went shopping yesterday, for argument's sake, and you're trying to remember what happened when you went shopping. You are unlikely to remember every single thing you saw and smelt and heard and did whilst you were at the shops. You'll probably just have a, a, a rough outline. I went to this shop, it was about this time, I bought these things, the shop was busy or it was half empty or whatever. You're unlikely to remember every single detail going. And if you are asked specific questions, did you see a woman in a blue dress in the shop? If you don't remember clearly, Nessa said you might start to distort your memory. You could be perfectly honest and say, I, I, I can't remember whether I did or not. Or, particularly if you're being pressured, let's say it's a police officer asking you this question, or a, a barrister in a court case trial saying, did you see a woman in a blue dress? And you're feeling under pressure. You might convince yourself you did see something when actually you've no real idea whether you saw it or not. But once you convince yourself something has happened, it feels like a real memory. Um, so obviously this has an impact on people giving eyewitness testimony around crimes they've seen, whether to the police or to, to a courtroom. What do they remember of events? How accurate is human memory? If it's as creative as Ulrich Nessa said, then it makes things a, a somewhat unreliable, somewhat dodgy to trust it. So when Maxine is interviewing the criminal, interviewing William, the question you could consider is how accurate are William's memories of his own crimes? Not just of the crimes in terms of who he stabbed and who he shot, but his motivations for the crime. She might be asking him, what did you feel when you did this? What was going through your mind when you did that? So it's not just his actions she's asking about, it's more um, subjective experiences she may be asking him about. Um, how accurate will William's memory be of things he did five years, 10 years, 15 years ago? Something to think about. This chap in the photograph is Carl Rogers. Uh, he was one of the founders and leading lights of the humanist branch of psychology. Now, just to clear up a slight confusion, within the realm of philosophy and religion, there is a movement called humanism, which believes that there is no such thing as God, or says there's, at least there's no evidence that God exists, or that the afterlife exists, or that the soul exists and therefore everything should be based upon science rather than upon what they refer to as superstition. Um, Rich, uh, Richard Hawkins is a... Uh, Dawkins, sorry, not Hawkins. Richard Dawkins is a very famous humanist at the moment, so is Brian Cox, a very famous humanist. That is not the same as humanist psychology. So humanist psychology doesn't say anything about God and religion as such. You could be a Christian humanist, a Muslim humanist psychologist, a Buddhist or an atheist or an anything else humanist psychologist. It's not the same as the thing that Richard Dawkins is talking about, even though it's called the same thing. So hopefully that confusion cleared up. Whereas Freud saw human nature as very grim, we are these impulsive, quite dangerous creatures, the humanists think people are basically lovely, that we're born decent and kind and caring, and we only become nasty and horrible later on in life because we are damaged by other people and by wider society. And it's that damage that warps us and turns us into potentially dangerous creatures. So it's a, a very different take on humanity and again do you go down, down more the Freud side of seeing pe people as very grim do you go down more the humanist side of seeing people as basically lovely or are you more inclined to the behaviorist argument that we are born neutral 
neither one thing nor another, but we can be trained to become good, bad or indifferent. Carl Rogers didn't say an awful lot about crime. He was much more interested in providing therapy for people in the community at large rather than talking about crime specifically. But his ideas can be applied to the area of crime. So one of the things he said is what's, what's the key to making people stay decent and good and, and positive and useful? Well, one of them, he said, is the feeling of, of being loved and valued and wanted. Do we feel loved and valued and wanted? Some people do, some people don't. If you don't feel wanted or loved, on an ongoing, on a one-off occasion, you bump into someone and they clearly don't like you. Well, you can cope with that. Most of us can cope with that. But what if you feel nobody likes you? Nobody loves you. Nobody wants you. And you felt like that for years and years and years and years. So it's not just some fleeting meeting with, with a one-off person. It's, it's the way your life feels in general. Roger said, if you feel like that, you will become more and more damaged, more and more cut off from other people. You'll find it harder and harder to like other people or want to be kind to other people. Things will turn very um, bitter for you. You might turn that bitterness inside and hurt yourself and become a, a drug addict or an alcoholic or harm yourself in various other ways. Or you might lash out and harm other people or, or do both indeed. But your life will not be a happy one. And so in order to help someone in that state, the job of the therapist <coughs> and of wider society, if it's willing to get involved, is to make that person feel valued. Say nice things to them, treat them well, make them feel wanted and loved. And it will take a while for them to believe it, but you know, gradually, 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 that person feels valued. So you could use this as a technique in prisons. It doesn't tend to be used very much because it's slow and tends to cost a lot. But does that criminal commit crime because they feel unwanted, unloved, rejected? They feel no one cares about them, therefore they don't care about anyone else. And so they're lashing out. And if they are made to feel useful and wanted and important members of the community, will they be more inclined to behave themselves and stop committing crime and start to become useful people? There are certainly quite a few examples of people who have changed their life, reformed, become good citizens after getting out of prison. It does happen. This phrase, conditions of worth, that you can see on the screen, Rogers said that a lot of people, perhaps the vast majority of people, are taught that they will only be loved and wanted if they behave in a very specific way. So they've got to kind of jump through hoops to earn the approval of the people around them, even if that means behaving in ways that feel very unnatural to them, that feel very odd to them or involve hiding and repressing parts of themselves to avoid upsetting the people they care about. And that's not a good way to be. It leads to what he called incongruity, where nothing feels right. You feel like you're permanently faking it. Nothing feels real. That's not a good condition to live in. It's very destructive. Alfred Adler, who wasn't entirely a humanist, he did have other ideas in other parts of psychology as well, but he had a foot in the camp of humanism. He said, we all have what is translated from the German, Alfred Adler was German, translated into English as the will to power. It's not a very good translation because it's not power as in kind of mad, cackling, rule the world type of power. Rather, it is the will to have control over your own life. We all want to feel in charge of our own life, of where we're going, make our own decisions, have our own choices feel as if we know what's going on but frequently life takes that control away from us we might fall very ill or we might be very young or very old and frail and other people are making decisions for us we might be in a prison where the prison officers are making decisions for us it could be in a criminal gang where where other members of the gang make decisions for you so there's always someone perhaps bullying you or or dominating you and your own sense of power and self-control diminishes which is not a happy healthy state to be in 
And Atlas says when that happens, we tend to start compensating. So if you feel weak in one area of your life, you might overcompensate in another area of life of becoming much more domineering. Like the, the stereotype timid little man at the office who goes home and is a right bully and a tyrant to his wife and children, even though he's this meek little mousy thing when he's at the office. So somebody who feels weak in one area becomes over the top in another area. That over the top just could be being a, a rude, obnoxious person, but it could potentially include turning to crime. So the person who really wants to hurt others, whether um, through violence, you know, beating them up, uh, stabbing them, shooting them, torturing them, or whether through sexual abuse or whether through robbing their houses and, and trashing the place and doing vile things in their home um, to really hurt them and get at them. Uh, and so often they, you do get some people who go in, steal stuff and go out again. Others will go in, steal stuff and then completely trash the place. And so a humanist will sometimes make the argument that that, that level of ugliness is a lashing out. It's a wish to really, really hurt the person who owns the house when they come home and find that someone has you know, urinated in their bed or you know, smashed things unnecessarily and done really vile, awful things. It's a lashing out. And that's because the individual feels so weak in some areas of their life. So the answer to this, the, the, the treatment for this, is to try and build the person up to help them find ways to exert more control over their life, but in positive, socially appropriate ways rather than abusive ways, to try and build things up. Another humanist, Abraham Maslow, developed the hierarchy of needs, this pyramid which you can see here, which is quite well known, quite famous, um, and said we all move through these stages of needing different things. So. You, you need food, you need water, you need somewhere to sleep that's safe, you need a, a source of income, you need to feel loved and wanted, that's same idea again, and so forth. And we move up these stages, the higher up these stages we get, the happier our lives are. But not everyone moves high up, some people get stuck somewhere down near the bottom and their life is not very happy. Uh, when that happens, they tend to fixate, overcompensate on what they can get because of the blockage of what they cannot work out how to get. So someone who um, doesn't feel very loved and wanted might overcompensate by becoming money mad. That money mad could just be then being very, very greedy and obsessed with material things. Or it could be the, the urge to steal stuff, to acquire more and more things, to fill the, the sort of sense of emptiness inside themselves. So whilst this isn't often used to understand criminals, it can be applied in that area. One argument that both Maslow and Rogers made is that creativity is very therapeutic. Art, dance, music, storytelling, all that sort of thing. And so this is one of the reasons why a lot of psychiatric hospitals and sometimes prisons as well, although they're not quite as often, but have things like art therapy, drama therapy, will use creative forms of self-expression because the argument is made that um, damaged people are damaged partially because they don't know how to express themselves. They don't know how to express their emotions, their feelings, how to, to sort of articulate what's going on in their heads. And so if they can be taught new ways to express themselves, taught to be artistic or to be musical or to be creative gardens or whatever kind of thing it is then that will help them deal with their emotions their feelings in a much more useful happy contented way and they won't therefore keep lashing out in destructive ways you might agree you might disagree but it's a thing to think about and we'll come back to these ideas in future weeks which brings us thankfully for your ears and my throat to the end of this and I hope this time this recording has actually worked because this is the second time I've done this. The first recording was um, ruined by computer glitches. 
Next week, we'll go into the brief history of crime and we'll, we'll look at the background to criminology and how criminology as an academic discipline developed and some of the early ideas in criminology. And we'll bounce around a few of the ideas we've spoken about this week. So I shall look forward to seeing you then. And if you've got any questions about this week's, you can either email them to me. We could have a Microsoft Teams chat or you might just want to wait until next week and ask them. Take care. See you soon.